Hello everyone, a very good afternoon. I would like to thank you all for joining us today. My name is Aparna and I'll be hosting this webinar. Before we get started, please let me take a few minutes to introduce Payat. Payat is a research-powered cybersecurity consulting firm. <clears throat> we have a decade-long track record with a singular focus on cybersecurity. The foundation of Payatu rests upon three pillars, community and conferences, consulting and training products. Community and conferences encompass Nalcon, an international security conference, training, and exhibition platform. Hardware.io, a hardware security-focused conference along with other initiatives. Consulting and training. Consulting and training focuses on thorough security assessments, which helps businesses to discover security threats and further provide training to strengthen network infrastructure. Lastly, we have four offerings, IoT Auditor, an IoT security testing and compliance platform, Exploit an open source IoT security testing framework, Exploit the Academy, a comprehensive online learning platform that empowers professionals with the knowledge and skill to excel in the field of cybersecurity, particularly in the context of securing IoT devices. Cloud First, an automated and highly scalable first testing platform. Here is an overview of the various consulting assessments we are known for across the globe. Payatu has delivered many cyber talks and workshops in top security conferences that also include Black Hat and DEF CON. We take pride in the DK log impact we have created by contributing to the cybersecurity community all around the world. As part of our ongoing commitment to fostering knowledge and collaboration in the cybersecurity realm, Payatu has launched an exciting initiative, the Payatu WhatsApp community. The community aims to educate various organizations with industry specific cybersecurity content. That was all about Payatu. Today, Syed, Payatu's Associate Security Consultant, will deliver a webinar on Active Directory Delegation Attacks. You can read all about him on this slide. Before I hand it over to Syed, I request you all to follow a few housekeeping tips. Please be on mute. If you have a question, you can write it in the chat box. We'll answer the questions during the intervals or at the end of the webinar. We will be releasing the recording of this webinar on our digital channels. So make sure you are following Payatu. If you are not currently following Payatu, please check the links provided in the chat box to find Payatu's digital channels. Without further ado, let's get started. Sayed, over to you. So hello all. Uh, this webinar is going to be on Active Directory Delegation Attacks. Now, the agenda of this webinar is to help you set up a delegation lab uh, a lab where you'll be able to configure or test out various delegation-based attacks or in AWS. Now you could use some other cloud providers as well, but then the provisioning part of the infrastructure has to be done on your end. Uh, you could use the playbooks in two part. Uh, the entire repository uh, code repository is available on GitHub and uh, you can host that into your infrastructure as and how it is required. Now, uh, the agendas are you will be spinning up your own delegation lab inside AWS. You'll understand and exploit various uh, delegation scenarios like a uh, Kerberos delegation, uh, unconstrained delegation, Kerberos constrained delegations, and resource based constrained delegations. Uh, the main key takeaways of this session are you'll be having an automatically spin up a uh, lab for active pen testing active directory environments where uh, I'm also planning to add on a few vulnerabilities for you guys to test along. As of now, the lab has all the delegation vulnerabilities configured and you can test around on that and play on those environments. The lab environment mainly takes around 25 to 30 minutes to spin up, but uh, yeah, there are minimum clicks involved. And also you'll be learning about the various tools and techniques required to exploit the delegation scenarios from either a Windows environment and a Linux environment. So uh, this is about me. Uh, you can find my social media handle. I go by the pseudonym of Greenmong 280 across all the platforms. And moving ahead uh, with the session, uh, the first thing that you need uh, during this session is you need to clone this uh, GitHub repository. Now uh, the lab and the other configuration will take some time and also you'll be having the recordings available. So. I would ask you to sit back, relax, and enjoy the webinar, learn uh, about the topics, take notes on them, and then you can uh, spin up your own 
lab in your AWS environment. Oh, now why I chose AWS is uh, the reason is uh, you have got a free tier and you can spin up the lab easily on your free tier account and then access it. Uh, just a side note, since uh, the lab uses uh, programmatic access so, uh, and uh, the lab is using Ansible, so what you would need to do is you need to configure your AWS CLI and uh, with the credentials of the user who has got uh, these uh, roles of uh, creating either a VPC, subnet, route tables, basically a full easy to uh, administrative access. Uh, so as you can see, I have put down uh, the AWS credentials and then I'll be using the AD lab profile inside my uh, GitHub. So, Let's move on to the first part, which is um, about provisioning the infrastructure inside AWS. So I already have a lab uh, environment uh, ready for uh, demonstrating, but I'll be showing you guys how you would need to set it up and uh, we'll be explaining you the scenarios. Yep. So uh, when you go to GitHub, you'll be finding this uh, repository where uh, if you move to the GitHub, you'll be finding this uh, delegation DAB repository, which is hosted. Uh, and the repository is being broken down into two parts. The first part is you will be provisioning the resources into your AWS. And the second part is going to be you'll be configuring the VMs that you have uh, deployed to your AWS account. Now, since the first part provisioning of the infrastructure and since we are using Windows, so it does take a bit uh, time. So what I will do is I'll quickly um, try to change the uh, profile uh, as it is required for provisioning the resources. Uh, so I'm using, uh, like I have configured my CLI with the profile named AD lab. So I'll be using that. And what this will do is this will basically create VPC, subnet, internet gateways, route tables, the security groups, it will find out the AMIs and then it will launch the subnets. So I'll be explaining that. But before that, what I would do is I have Ansible installed on this machine and I'll simply run Ansible playback provision.yaml file and what this Ansible file will do is it will start creating the resources. So if you move on to the uh, roles folder over here, you will find that I have uh, created a bunch of uh, roles and I have defined out the playbook structure. So when I want to create a VPC, uh, you can customize uh, this as to your own liking as well. I have used uh, tried to use multiple variables so you can uh, change along and play with uh, those names and basically how the infrastructure um, is provisioned it will automatically now as you can see it is uh, creating the vpc it is creating the public subnet and the private subnet um, it is creating the internet gateway for routing the traffic it is creating the route tables through which the public subnet can be accessed uh, it is creating the security groups and also it has started to launch the public subnet EC2 and private subnet EC2. Once the EC2 instances are launched, you will also find that the instances IPs would be listed down for you. Now, uh, like once the public EC2 instances are launched, you need to make sure that the private EC2 instances, since they are Windows instances, and uh, you need to configure them using Ansible. So from the runtime when you started, uh, give it around eight to 10 minutes so that the machines on the private subnet, they can like have the WinRM configured on them. And uh, you can, then Ansible is going to use WinRM uh, behind the hood uh, to configure those machines. So moving on to the slides again. So uh, for provisioning the infrastructure, what you can do is you can use this command Ansible playbook, then provision.yaml. Uh, obviously you need to have Ansible and uh, your CLI, AWS CLI installed in order to work. 
And if you want to destroy the infrastructure, it is as simple as uh, Ansible playbook destroy.yaml once you are done with the, all the testing and other stuff. Now, uh, explaining you guys the uh, lab architecture. So it goes as follows. You have got a public subnet, uh, wherein you have a Windows machine, which is posted on the 10.0.1.10 and the Ubuntu attacker machine, which is on 10.0.1.20. Uh, so you can use either Windows based tools or Linux based tools. And from here on, you can try to exploit the scenarios. And uh, this public subnet only is accessible either via SSH or WinRM or RDP. And when we talk about the private subnet, so this private subnet is basically inside of AWS and this can be ex like accessed only via these uh, jump machines. So you need to uh, access to this jump server and then from here on, you will be able to access uh, the inside AWS environment. Now, as you mentioned, like uh, it was basically a four machine lab, but you are seeing five machine lab. So I try to make the scenario as such that whether you want to try the attack scenarios from Windows or you want to try out the attack scenarios from Linux, you can do as in how you would like to explore. But yeah, ideally, uh, once you will definitely need the Ubuntu machine uh, in order to spin up the infrastructure, I, I mean, configure the machines inside of the lab. And once that is done, uh, you can simply uh, delete this uh, or uh, like shut it down the, the Ubuntu instance. So you'll have essentially have four machines. So uh, now I mentioned that the lab setup is basically a uh, two parts or two step process. So once all the instances are up, we will find that you are able to open all these three IPs, 10.0.10.10, which is for the domain controller, which I have named as DC01. Uh, then you have the web server, which is at 10.0.10.20 and the production server, which is, which is hosted at 10.0.10.30. So uh, once these machines are up and the WinRM protocol is running, then Ansible is going to configure uh, them via this Ubuntu attacker machine. So what we will be doing is uh, once we have the IP of the Ubuntu attacker machine, we will be logging into the Ubuntu attacker machine. We will be installing Ansible again on this, uh, installing a bunch of tools like the Impacket Toolkit, Crackmap Exec. And then from here on, we will run again the second command, which is required to provision the resources inside of the AWS. So I have uh, written a Ansible script, um, like bash script, which basically does is first install the Ansible using the ansible.sh. And then domain create.ss is going to run multiple uh, playbooks, which is going to finally spin up the lab. So you can also, if you would like uh, to read more about the documentation, I have created a wiki section and the wiki basically hosts the installation steps and the solutions as well. So post this session, if you would like to explore it or explore on the attack scenarios, you can definitely uh, take a look at that. Uh, so now I believe the instances are up. Uh, what I will do is I'll be SSHing into, first of all, I'll be using rsync. To basically synchronize the files from this machine uh by the way is the font legible or should i make it a bit large this is good sir yeah. sorry So from your folders uh, root file, what you need to do is I'll be using rsync to synchronize the files from here to the Ubuntu attacker machine. And now I'll simply SSH using the key pair that I just generated using the user Ubuntu onto this uh, Ubuntu attacker machine. So voila, you're inside. Now you can move to this delegation lab cup folder and over here, what you need to do is uh, if you have your infrastructure configured or 
once you configure it yourself, if you want to configure the infrastructure yourself, you want that, okay, you're hosting it inside your VM, then also you can use the same techniques. Uh, you will be basically spinning up all the machines. You will be uh, configuring the proper subnet as in how it is required. And then move to the scripts folder from the Linux machine. You're going to run the Ansible installations uh, script, which will basically install Ansible onto your system. And what this script does is, if I move to the, this is basically updating the system, installing crack map exec, then installing a bunch of, bunch of tools like uh, Ansible, PyVNRM, Impacket Toolkit, Coursor. Now coursing is at the moment not supported in the uh, lab environment, but uh, that functionality would be added very soon. Also, it will install Bloodhound if you want to remotely uh, like uh, do some collection of data from that and then want to investigate that into Bloodhound. It will also install the Ansible requirements. And what you need to do at last is you just need to add the Ansible into your path so that uh, the domain create command can uh, work ideally. So it is taking some time for crackmap exec to load. Meanwhile, let me take a look at the chat if you guys have any questions. Uh, so this is going to take another couple of minutes. Meanwhile, while this loads, uh, we have an advantage that uh, the Windows machines should be up uh, with WinRM configured and you should be able to access them. Now I have another lab environment uh, set up so that during the session, uh, like we don't have any issues and we can move along while I just show you how the domain creation command works. Sayed, so, uh, there is yeah. a question in the chat box. Okay, yeah. Can we connect it with our own machine? Uh, sorry, Sajid, uh, right now, if you try to connect to the lab environment using your own machine, uh, that can cause some issues, but yeah, definitely you can create a pre-tiered account and then uh, use it to basically configure the environment. All the machines that I'm using here in the lab are T2 micro instances. So that is being supported by the free tier and no other paid uh, features are being used. So now Ansible should be configured. Yeah. As you can see, Ansible is configured. What I will do is now, so what we did is we used first the ansible.sh to configure this Ubuntu attacker machine and install Ansible onto it. Now, next, what you need to do is move into this Ansible directory. And from here, you will run this domain create dot uh, sh. But before that, I'll make sure that the machines are up. So this is my domain controller IP. I can see that uh, the domain controller is up. Also the web SRV machine, which is hosted at 10.20 is up. And the prod SRV, which is hosted at 10.30, that machine is up as well. So we are good to go. You can create the, now use the domain create.sh script inside of the Ubuntu attacker instance that you created on your AWS. And then it is going to do a bunch of tasks that I'm going to show you right now. So domain create.sh is doing the following. It is basically renaming the hosts with the as and when required like DC01 prod SRV or web SRV. Now post the renaming of the host. Uh, I guess the fonts are a bit. Uh, sorry. Yeah, this is perfect. Yeah. So uh, the rename host is going to basically rename the um, machines inside of your private subnet. Then once the Windows machines are renamed, uh, then you need to essentially restart those machines and the reboot can take certain amount of time. So what I've done is I have put in a sleep timer of around 120 seconds or two minutes. Once that is done, we'll be using the installed adds.yaml file uh, where I have configured 
Like when you install Active Directory, you need to install the Active Directory domain services. Then you need to run the DC promo step to promote your machine to domain controller. So this install ADDS script is going to do the following task for you. Set DNS is going to set uh, configure the DNS on the machines that are to be joined because if a machine is to join to the domain controller, it has to make sure that it properly points to the domain controller as its DNS server. Once that is done, you run the join domain uh, script to basically join your machine, uh, which is the prod SRV and web SRV in this case, to the domain controller. Once that is done, we'll be adding the user, we'll be configuring the unconstrained delegation, constrained delegation and resource-based constrained delegation. And also lastly, um, there are a bunch of users that I have created. So you can uh, refer to the default credentials from the add user.yaml file. So these users, like the domain user, I want uh, a domain user to be a local admin onto that machine. So on the web SRV and prod SRV, I have made that user as a local admin. And finally, I have uh, installed the SMB SIPS uh, file share, essentially SMB v1, so that uh, I can uh, like the, some of the vulnerabilities work properly. So if you go to the playbooks and you check the add user.yaml file, so you can see that IIS SVC has got the following password, prod SVC user has got the following password, RBCD has got the following password. Now uh, you need to make sure that uh, you need to follow certain password complexity rules for it to work because Windows by default uh, does not allow you to use weak credentials. So you just have to keep that in mind and let's see, okay. So you can see that uh, it is renaming the host, uh, the host renaming is successful. Uh, it is going to wait for what is the seconds for it to reboot. Once that is done, it is setting up the DNS and then installing the ADS feature. It is going to take some amount of time. And once uh, that is done, it's going to slowly and gradually uh, configure all the vulnerabilities and you should be good to go to play on this lab. So once you have the IPs like Ubuntu machines IP or the Windows attackers IP. So what you can do is like, let me exit out of it. So you can SSH into it using uh, the key pair that was on your document root. And from here on, you will have tools like uh, from the in packet, like add computer or other stuff. So you can play uh, play around as you like, whether you want to use a uh, crack map exec that should be installed into your lab environment as well. And you pretty much have a good to go environment. Uh, also like, as you can see over here, Just a minute, guys. So as you can see, uh, this is the random uh, public IP instance that I got. And from here, I can RDP and access ID, either it's be the domain controller, or I can log into the normal web SRV machine, or if I want, I can RDP into the prod SRV machine. So we are good to go with the labs. Uh, any questions still here? Uh, yes, uh, Shajit, we can set it up on your own lo local machine. So what you will do is in that case, uh, for the things to work properly, either you will be configuring the things or playing around, tweaking around with the things. Or what you can do is you will need to, uh, let me go back to the slides. So over here, you are seeing the public uh, subnet and the private subnet, right? But uh, your machine should have the resources, uh, sufficient amount of resources to be able to handle that. So what you can do is uh, Ubuntu or any other Linux distro, you can install that onto your, uh, so you can install either this Ubuntu or any other uh, instance as in how you like. And then you will need to have uh, three machines set up, which is in this case, DC01, 
web SRV01 and prod SRV01. Uh, basically, they are IPs you need to make sure. And then you need to have WinRM, which uh, runs on by default. Uh, so you need to have this WinRM, which runs on 5.9.8.5 by default. So that is uh, required for, uh, can this be removed? So I hope that answers your question. Quick summary of the setup, please. Uh, Mangesh, uh, what, okay. So what we did uh, so far is, we cloned this GitHub repository. You have configured your AWS CLI with um, all the required access keys and uh, the other roles. Obviously the profile that you are using that you need to use inside the delegation lab repository uh, uh, in the provision.yaml and destroy.yaml file respectively. Once that is done, what you'll do is you'll use Ansible playbook provision.yaml. This will take around eight to 10 minutes to spin up all the machines. And once that is done, uh, you'll have a infrastructure which simulates this, but the host names and other things won't be replicated so far, just the IPs are replicated. Now, in order to create this red dot local domain, what you need to do is you'll have to run this second command, which is basically you will assist it onto the uh, Ubuntu machine. Then you'll use rsync to synchronize file from your Ubuntu instance to the machine uh, on the like the cloud and then from the Ubuntu attacker machine, you use ansible.sh to install ansible. And then finally, you, once that is done and all the machines in the private subnet, they have an RM configured. Then you use this uh, domain create.sh to basically do the DC promo and all the necessary stuff. Uh, Ikram, uh, I'm not using any vulnerable ISOs. These are the plain images that are on the cloud. So if that is done, uh, then within a few moments, uh, you will have uh, the lab instances up and running. As you can see, once ADDS feature is installed, the domain creation process takes place now. We are waiting for another 300 seconds for the domain controller to be up. And once that is up, uh, we can uh, like move forward. So, now let's take a look at the next part. Which is Kerberos authentication. Also like uh, if you guys uh, have any questions or need the documentation, so uh, that documentation is ideally hosted on the GitHub. So you can uh, check the wiki section of the GitHub and you'll find everything hosted over there. So now uh, we are going to talk about the Kerberos authentication mechanism. We have to run YAML after SSH onto our local system. Uh, Sajid, uh, the Ubuntu or the attacker machine that you are working on, uh, we'll be moving to the Q&A uh, for the setup post uh, this. Let's uh, first talk about the vulnerabilities and the main agenda of the session. So <clears throat> now we are going to talk about uh, Kerberos authentication. So uh, in Windows environments, uh, there are two kinds of authentication mechanisms that happens. One is uh, either we are using NTLM based authentication or the second thing that we are using is Kerberos based authentication. So now uh, the NTLM, <clears throat> so now the NTLM based authentication is uh, getting like discarded and we are moving to the Kerberos based authentication mechanisms only, wherein uh, there are the following six steps involved in the process. So to give you a brief idea, what happens in this process is, suppose there is a user and then as we know, there is a domain controller or the DC. So what the domain controller does is, like when a user wants to authenticate to the AD, what that user will do is, user will log into the workstation 
Now the when the user logs into the workstation, the user's username and password, it sends it along with the timestamp to the Kerberos uh, in the domain controller. You have a KDC, uh, KDC or key distribution center. So in the KDC, there are the authentication server and the ticket gra uh, granting server. So in the first step, what we do is we use the username password credentials and along with the timestamp, we send an ASREC or an authentication server request to the authentication server that, hey, uh, DC, I want to authenticate to you or hey, domain, I want to authenticate to you. Now, what this uh, Kerberos key distribution uh, like the authentication server on the KDC is going to do is it is going to check, okay, if the credentials are correct or not, provided uh, how, like if uh, do not require pre-authentication or other things are enabled or disabled. And uh, based on that, the authentication is going to reply back in an authentication re server response. And in the authentication server response, what you get is essentially a TGT, Kerberos TGT. Okay, so in the first step, you request a TGT. And once you have a, like once per login session, you have a TGT. Now, the next step is you want to access a certain service. For example, this is a file server support and you want to access this file server. So what you will do is the user's TGT is, a, it is essentially saved into the LCS process on the computer or the workstation. The workstation at the next, next step is going to send the TGT and the service principal name or the SPN of the service that the workstation wants to access. It will send again a request to the TG ticket granting server on the KDC that, hey, uh, I want to access this service which has the following SPN and here is my TGT. Now, uh, this goes in the TGS request or TGS rec as we call it. And in the TGS response, we get back the TGS or ticket granting service. Now using this TGS, what we do is we try to send an application server a request like we use this TGS and then we send the application server a request that hey, here is the TGS and I want to access the following service. And then uh, the server accepts the TGS and then based on that uh, application server in the application server response, we get uh, all these like service ticket as how it is required to access the service. So this is a brief about the, how the Kerberos authentication mechanism is ha happening. Like normally when a user is trying to access services. Now we move to the next part, which is what is this Kerberos delegations actually? So Kerberos delegation is basically it allows end user to reuse credentials in a multi-tier application where Kerberos double hop is required. What I mean by that is, suppose a user, uh, as you can see in this case, uh, there is a user, he authenticates to the DC and on that domain, uh, using that he has a TGT or a TGS and then he tries to access the web server. Now in the, uh, now the user wants to access some like the web server wants to send this user some data and that is from the database server. Now this web server cannot be given the access to the entire database. So in Windows Server 2000 machines, uh, this Kerberos, uh, the unconstrained delegation and then 2003, uh, the constrained delegation things were uh, brought up in place where essentially the user, like the web server is given a mechanism so that it can use the end user's credentials and how it is going to use that via some impersonation mechanism. Okay. So how this uh, is happening is, suppose a user provides credential to the domain controller that we did, uh, which was an AS rec, like authentication server request, as we could see, uh, recall from the previous image. Then the DC returned a TGT, now the user requests a TGS to the web service on the web server and the DC provides a TGS. So, so far all these four and five steps are similar. Now what we do is 
the user sends the TGT and the TGS to the web server. So if uh, this was a server that had unconstrained delegation on it, then essentially over here, it would send the TGT and TGS both. But without that, it will just send the TGT. Uh, sorry, TGS, not the TGT. But if the server had unconstrained delegation, then it will send the uh, TGT alongside the TGS. Now the web server, what it will do is, the web server servlet account will use the user's TGT to request a TGS on behalf of the user from the DC. And then the web server service account connects to the database server as that user in order to fetch uh, the resources essentially. Now, broadly speaking, delegation can be classified into two categories. One of them is unconstrained delegation and the next is constrained delegation. What now, let's take a look at what unconstrained delegation is and what a constrained delegation is. So in unconstrained delegation, what we can do is, uh, or if a server or a computer is given unconstrained delegation, uh, keep in mind, these delegations can be given either to users or computers. So if a user or a computer is given const unconstrained delegation, it can access any service on any computer in the domain. And if you have got constrained delegation, then you can access the specified services that will be there in the, uh, like the SPS that we are allowed to delegate to. And then on the specified computer that is again mentioned over here. So that is what in layman's term we call as unconstrained or constrained delegation. Also there is the resource based constrained delegation that we are going to take at towards the end. So in this first, uh, Unconstrained delegation, the history is uh, like it was introduced into the server 2000 to solve the uh, double hop problem. And what it basically did is if unconstrained delegation was uh, there on a machine, then the DC places the user's TGT inside the TGS and when presented to the server with unconstrained delegation, the TGT is extracted from the TGS and stored in the LSAS process. So in this case, if a web server uh, consider that uh, there is a web server that has unconstrained delegation, what it could mean is you could access or like when you access the uh, web server with uh, unconstrained delegation, your end user domains credentials or TGTs are essentially stored onto the machine. Now, what could be the possible impact of that? This could be used as a privilege escalation vector as if a domain admin or any user who authenticates or accesses uh, the web server, his use uh, his credentials are stored on that machine. Uh, his TGTs are stored on the machine. And what if we are able to compromise a machine with unconstrained delegation? Then we can dump the LSAS, uh, basically the tickets from the LSAS, and then we can use those tickets or we could impersonate so that is the impact of uh, unconstrained delegation. Now there could be mm, two scenarios uh, that uh, like exploitation in the exploitation that generally helps. The most popular one is the Kerbos unconstrained delegation on a machine. And then there is a printer bug. And the, like another one is like a sensitive user, like a domain admin authenticates to the machine with Kerbos unconstrained delegation. So you have got admin access on a machine with a Kerberos unconstrained delegation. Now, if a sensitive user authenticates to that machine, then you will get that user's uh, tickets. Or if the printer bug is in place, then what you can do, you can essentially force uh, that uh, DC machine to basically authenticate uh, to the machine with uh, unconstrained delegation forcefully. And then that would land you with uh, like that machine accounts credentials. Essentially, the DC is the one we will be targeting in this case. So now let's take a demo. If my DC is using unconstrained or constrained delegation. Yeah, we are going to take a look at the, the demo of that. So uh, also like a uh, 
by the time uh, we were discussing about that, I would like to show you this that, yeah, this uh, lab environment is up and running. Now, there are a bunch of things that I have already pre-configured. So what I will do is I'll simply destroy this infra ins instance or let's keep it towards the end if uh, we face some issues uh, in the previously hosted instances. Yeah. So now uh, the machine uh, web SRV in this case has got a uh, unconstrained delegation and how you could check on that, uh, that was your question. So if you come to the solution book, uh, I have posted on the com commands as well. So there are multiple ways uh, to check uh, that uh, their uh, machine is having unconstrained delegation or a user account is having unconstrained delegation. What you could do is uh, suppose uh, you compromised a domain user. Okay. So in case of Active Directory attacks, we either had to compromise or gain in a foothold some way, or we have to go via the assume breach scenario where we are assuming that we have end user credentials and we will be moving from there on. So if you have got a domain user credentials, uh, mark my words, uh, we are not talking about I mean, like local admin access, but we are talking about we need domain user credentials in order to enumerate the environment. So once we have that, what you could do is, uh, like there are a bunch of ways to enumerate. You could use either the AD module or you could use the AD search for the LDAP queries or you could use uh, things like Power View or you could use something from the end packet which has find delegation. So in the first case, if you ha have the AD module installed, so what you can do is you can uh, simply import the uh, AD module and then what you will do is you will be t essentially looking for the property trusted for delegation. So in this case, what I'm doing is get AD computer is used to find computers in the domain. And then I'm filtering for the accounts where trusted for delegation is equal to true or the trusted for delegation property is set. And the primary group ID is 550, which is going to list out the computer accounts uh, apart from the domain controller. So keep in mind that domain controllers by default has have this unconstrained delegation, but uh, that is a property. And if you get a uh, local admin access on a domain controller, then the domain is essentially compromised. So without that, uh, these domain uh, like servers with unconstrained delegation, these could be potential high value targets for privilege escalation. So as you can see, we can use the get AD computer module. Uh, I'll not be running all these commands, but yeah, a bunch of them just to show you the uh, result. So as you can see uh, over here, I'm using the AD search module. And then again, I'm looking for computer object where this user account control property is set, which is essentially this trusted for delegation. Also, power you have this nice uh, command which is get net computer, and then you use the unconstrained flag, and it is going to list out all the machines. As you can see, we have the DC and the web server. Out of them, the DC by default will have the unconstrained delegation, but the web server is a potential high value target. And find domain delegation is going to use basically basically the domain user credentials, and if you specify the domain, then it is going to look for all the delegation types like unconstrained or constrained delegations. So I'm using the AD search module in this case. And uh, so as you guys can see, I have got the AD search module, AD modules, then Mimikatz and a bunch of tools uh, on this machine. What I will do is I'll run the command, AD search command basically. And to list out the computer objects where the trusted to uh, trusted for delegation property was set. And in response, AD search is run a bunch of LDAP query and it lists out that the domain control is the one which has a constrained delegation and then web SRV is the one which has got unconstrained delegation. So, so far, uh, so good. Uh, I guess for some reason this machine, okay, my bad. Now, since we are on this machine, uh, web SRV, and we have made the assumption that we are essentially, we have a local admin access. So you could use whom I or 
net um, local group administrators to check that, okay, if you are, sorry, administrators. So this red DOM user, domain user basically, and who may we are basically this domain user. So the tools were essentially placed inside of uh, Windows tasks tools folder. Uh, these tools uh, are not there by default. So you'll have to use your file transfer uh, methods or like work it out on them. Basically you can host a file uh, file server on your Ubuntu machine and then from there on you can pull these files onto this machine using wget. So the next thing what you can do is you can use something like Rubius to list out all the tickets that are there presently. So we can see that we have just the domain user and the web SRV credentials. Uh, KLS will also show that, okay, these are the tickets that are currently inside of this session. Mm. Now what we can do is you could use something like Rubius monitor with an interval of five seconds, uh, filter for user, his name is administrator. And uh, no wrap, just so that the ticket isn't wrapped. Now, suppose I have a local admin access on this machine with unconstrained delegation, and I just ran this uh, like, brand Rubius in the background to monitor for the TGTs. Now, unfortunately the printer bug isn't uh, here, so I cannot show you forced authentication, but yeah, what I can do is I can simulate a scenario wherein the DC is trying to list out files via on the C drive. Web SRV is the machine red dot local is the domain and over here I'm trying to access the C drive. So the domain administrator who, who was it? It was the, it was the administrator on the red dot local domain. And you can see this is the DC. The impact of this is unconstrained delegation. Since we had the unconstrained delegation. So you can see that, okay, we now have the ticket of the administrator or the domain administrator account. And like what you could do is using this, you could essentially, oh, just a minute, the lab is a bit lagging for me. So once you have this, uh, like KList is right now not showing the tickets. If I try to access the DCs, C drive that would be access denied by default. Uh, now, once you have this ticket, you could use something like a Rubius pass the ticket module and then you will basically specify the ticket uh, which was the base 64 uh, encoded data that we got uh, previously and then you can use KLS to list the controls tickets for the current session and if you try to list the C drive on the domain controller you will be able to access it. So moving ahead with that I use again the Rubius pass the ticket module and the ticket is So once that is done, I hit enter and you can see that tickets have been successfully imported. If I run the K list now, you will see that uh, administrator at the date red.local, we have successfully impersonated that user. And now we can list out the C share 
on the domain controller, which we previously couldn't because we did not have the privileges to do so. So we have successfully impersonated the domain administrator. So this is one scenario uh, or this is how we could uh, essentially exploit const unconstrained delegation. Now let's talk about uh, Kerbo's constrained delegations. So in case of constraint delegation, since this was a problem, like uh, the server was essentially caching the TGT or the end user's TGTs. Uh, so this was a sensitive. So what Windows Microsoft did is in Windows Server 2003, uh, Microsoft introduced a new type of delegation, which was known as Kerberos constraint delegation or KCD. So in constraint delegation, a constraint delegation is a more secure way of delegating that delegation that restrict the services to which a service can delegate authentication. So it provides a more granular control over the delegation permissions. So now you won't be allowed to delegate to anything. You will be allowed to delegate only based on certain properties. Like uh, there is a property named MSDS allowed to delegate to, and then you'll be uh, able to delegate only to those services. So the server with constraint delegation can no longer cache the TGTs. So this could also be, this comes in handy when there is a case of protocol transition where the user authenticates to a web server without using Kerberos and then the web, ser uh, web service makes a request to the database server to fetch the results based on the user's authentication. So now the user is not using uh, Kerberos authentication. The user is like, as you normally log into a uh, web server, you are logging in, but then the server with the constraint delegation or the there is service account with constraint delegation what they can do is they can potentially impersonate anyone on that specified service where uh, that is uh, like a uh, configured for uh, like constraint delegation so again the impact could be we could escalate to a domain admin we could essentially impersonate a domain admin in case we compromise an account with or a computer with Kerberos constraint delegation. Now, uh, joke over here is like uh, Microsoft says that you can uh, uh, like impersonate only selected services that are being mentioned in this uh, uh, MSDS allowed to delegate to properties like basically the SPNs. But uh, if you use RubyS module or there are multiple modules, so you could specify something like an alt service name property. So in that alt service name property, you could specify something like if you have given the permission to SIFS, which is essentially the file share, but if you'd like to access LDAP, so that is also possible. And then that will be troublesome, like because you can ideally impersonate and any domain administrator and then any services for that as that domain administrator. So again, uh, accounts with constraint delegation, these are uh, like sensitive as well. So to impersonate a user <coughs> service for user or S4U extension inside RubyS is used, which provides two extensions. The first one is service for user to self or S4U to self, and then we use S4U to proxy. So what this S4U to self module does is it allows a service to obtain a forwardable TGS to itself. So it allow it is allowing the service to obtain a forwardable TGS to itself on behalf of a user. So we are getting a T forwardable TGS on behalf of another user. And then the service account must have the trusted to auth for delegation uh, attribute set. So the account needs to have a trusted to auth for delegation attribute set. And then the service uh, that we will essentially be delegating to uh, that will be mentioned in the MSDS allowed to delegate to attribute. So service for user to proxy will what do is then the service ticket that we obtain we will use that and then it allows a service to obtain a TGS to a second service on behalf of a user. So this, uh, like which service we are going to access that will be controlled by this MSDS allowed to delegate to attribute. And this attribute basically contains a list of SPNs, which we will be taking a look at right now. Uh, so uh, roughly giving you an idea of what happens is, uh, basically a user authenticates to a web server, uh, in this case, a prod SVC using a non-Kerberos authentication mechanism, like you are accessing a web server. 
Now the web server service requests a tickets to the key distribution center KDC for users account without supplying a password as prod SVC account. Prod SVC is trusted for delegation. So what it will do is it will send out that, okay, I want a service ticket for this account. Now the KDC will check the prod SVC's user account control value. And it will say that it is trusted to authenticate for delegation. So DC understand, okay, the service account is trusted for delegation. And then it will look at the protected users group. So if the user is not a member of the protected users group, uh, like this user, uh, suppose it was not a member of the protected users group, then the DC will pass the uh, pass this ticket back to the key, uh, like uh, if okay, then returns a forwardable TGS to the user's account. So as for you to self is done, the user sends out a, uh, uh, like uh, basically the request for uh, like authentication, the web server then uh, sends a request to the key distribution center that uh, I would like to uh, like impersonate this user. And then the DC is happily giving out the forwardable TGS. Now the service then passes this ticket back to the key DC for uh, like whatever service it wanted to access. And the KDC will check the MSDS allowed to delegate to field on the prod SVC account. If the service is listed, uh, it will return a service ticket for uh, that service. And then the web service can now authenticate to the whatever service it wanted to access. Now this constraint delegation, the essentially s you to self or s you to proxy, this thing looks complicated or if you try to understand that at first, uh, that looks uh, a bit complicated. So what we can do is, uh, like I'll be showing you the demonstration for that. Uh, before that, uh, I just saw a question. Uh, uh, I'm not able to see, yeah. So I just saw a question which mentioned that, is there any bloodhound query to find out unconstrained delegation? Uh, so, uh, also is there a way to check if my DC is using unconstrained or const uh, delegation or constraint? So Kranti by default, all the domain controllers have this, like they will be using unconstrained delegation only. This is a, uh, like a normal thing. And Shubham coming to your question, Bloodhound query, like when you run Bloodhound, Bloodhound basically runs an ingester, which runs a bunch of queries and it allocates all the data and then, uh, combines them into a zip file. Now, once you import that zip file inside your bloodhound, then you can like uh, check for uh, like queries, like there will be multiple properties or uh, default queries uh, where you'll be finding that, okay, you can check for these. Okay. And now moving ahead with the demonstration. Uh, okay. So since uh, this uh, is a bit complicated, I'll be showing you the demonstration of this. Uh, I guess there is some issues. Yep. So now what we are assuming is we have got, uh, we, or we want to find a machine with constraint delegation. So again, we could use something like the AD module or AD search or power view, which does a fantastic job or impact it. So, uh, Again, what we are looking for is right now, in case of AD module, we are looking for if MSD is allowed to delegate property is not null or like we are looking for uh, object user, user accounts, which have the MSD uh, allowed to delegate to, to property, not null or trusted to auth for delegation. If you use the power view module, so it will give you this uh, result as trusted to auth for delegation. And that will also have the MSD allowed to delegate to property. So in this case, we'll be using the power view module.
power view over here. And now what I do is get net user trusted to auth, and then I'm selecting just a bunch of properties out of them. So it is right now it is showing that the prod SVC account is allowed and then uh, like to what? To basically SIFS uh, file service or on the DC. You could essentially remove that and then it will uh, be listing out a detailed information, which you can see that trusted to auth for delegation is set to true. And the MSDN allowed to delegate to properties set. What we could do in this case is, We could use a simple thing, which is again, use the Ruby S uh, uh, like RC4 hash, uh, like since we have, uh, let's take a look at the exploitation scenario at first. So one scenario could be a uh, command execution as the user with uh, KDC permission. So if you have that permission, then you could use TGT delegate to get a ticket and then uh, basically uh, forward that ticket and we are exploiting the second scenario over here where we have the KDC user accounts uh, password or hashes. So we basically use the rubyus uh, hash uh, command to generate the uh, RC4 hash or the NTLM hash for uh, like AES hash basically for this user. So we go get the RC4 hash for this user. And before running this, let's check if uh, like K list. So there are a bunch of tickets. I guess I will be able to access the DC as well. So what I will do is I'll do purge and hopefully I should not be able to. Okay. I believe I should be rebooting the system. Meanwhile, guys, just give me a minute. Yep, sorry for the trouble. So let me, I need to RDP basically into that machine again. as the domain user. I see a bunch of questions. Slide setting is very confusing. Can you elaborate this in a more simpler way if you have time? Uh, yeah, Ashwini, uh, like we'll be getting back to that in a moment. Like I, as I previously mentioned, this is a bit confusing. So like, let's take a look at the demonstration first and then try to understand. So I believe, yeah, if I try to list the C drive on the DC, yeah, access generated, perfect. So we are again into, into our tools folder. If we try to list out the C drive on the DC, this should give us an access denied, right? Now I'll be copy pasting the commands uh, to make it a bit quick. What I can do is I can use the power view and then uh, get net user trusted to auth. importing the power view. Instead to auth. 
this is giving me the user that okay prod svc user is uh, trusted for uh, delegation and as we confirmed previously we cannot list the c drive on the domain controller right because we are in the domain admin what we will be doing now is we will be using the user's credentials uh, like assuming this is again an assumption that we have the service accounts credential or somehow we have obtained the user's credential who have constraint delegations so using the first this password uh, module to uh, it has not copied So using first this password module, I'll basically be generating the RC4 hash for this user. And then in the next step, what I can do is I'll use the Rubius S4U extension. And uh, for the domain red.local user is prod as we see, I'll be specifying the RC4 hash. I'll be specifying the impersonate user. So before running the commands, let me also list out the tickets. Uh, there is no ticket right now for administrator at the rate right dot local, which is the domain administrator. Now what I do is, I basically run the rubyus S4U extension where I'll be specifying the domain name. I'll be specifying the user name who is having the constrained de delegation property. I'm specifying the RC4 hash password, which we generated previously. So it, this is the one that we generated previously. We are telling that we want to impersonate the user administrator and this MSDS SPN saves a DC01. This is the one that we obtained uh, from the MSDS allowed to delegate to property. So using that, we now use node app and then we pass the ticket. So it will do a bunch of thing. It will do at first the S for you to self request. So it is getting a TGS for administrator to prod as we see at the red, at the red, red dot local. And then what it is using is doing is it is impersonating user administrator to target SPN saves, building S for you to proxy request and then S for you to proxy success happens and you have the administrator's uh, ticket basically which has also been imported so if i run the klist command now you'll see that there is this one ticket for administrator and i guess i should have typed that so now again we are able to list out the things on the domain controller now, uh, there is something called, uh, let me clear it out. There is something called Mimikatz. Uh, Mimikatz has basically a DC sync module. I guess I haven't mentioned that over here. So if you guys open up, uh, the Mimikatz uh, documentation, you'll find that Mimikatz has got a DC sync module. But uh, like if you try to run that DC sync, that is not going to work by default. So what you need to do in this case is, um, you need to use this again, the Rubius module, but this time you have to specify the alt service name attribute, and then you have to specify LDAP because Rubius uses LDAP. So now you needed a ticket to save the service, but you will be getting a ticket to LDAP service as well. So that is the reason I was mentioning that uh, this is a joke for Microsoft because they see that, okay, only selected services, but yeah, the user you are impersonating to, if he is running a certain service, you will be able to impersonate that service as well because that SPN property is essentially not encrypted. Now I'll be going to the co questions. As you mentioned, unconstrained delegation is, uh, sorry. It is default, we can just, may you please share the workflow. 
use the polar hub query or constraint delegation. If this is by default, can we restrict this using GPUs of altering any security settings? Uh, Kranti, uh, ideally we don't, uh, like we should not be setting up unconstrained delegation on any of those uh, like normal servers. And even if you are setting up, we need to make sure that no one is able to access those servers or th those accounts because these are potentially high value targets. Slide 17 is very confusing. Uh, Ashwini, were you able to understand the attack scenario right now? Uh, as you mentioned, unconstrained delegation is uh, set on the server. Similarly, is constrained delegation to set on the server? No, constrained delegation is uh, not set on the uh, server by default. You will uh, uh, like be able to do that. How frequently the administrator ticket will be issues for us to copy? Uh, Kranti, I haven't, I did not understand your question. But yeah, since we are moving uh, like out of time a little bit. So I'll be wrapping up with the final uh, topic before taking up the questions. So, so far uh, we did talk about unconstrained and constrained delegations. Now, uh, as I was mentioning that command execution can be used to uh, like we can have a command execution property and then if we have the command execution we can use something like tgt delegate to basically with the s4u module and uh, if we have the domain users credential then you uh, like with constraint delegation so you could see what uh, like how we use the s4u module and since spns are not in person uh, like encrypted so you could use something like the alt service module and that mimicats uh, using that with mimicats is uh, like an exercise for you like you need to basically impersonate with, with the alt surface name of LTAP and then you try to like run the DC sync command that will work. Now oh, comes the last topic which is the resource based constraint delegation. So resource based constraint delegation is a feature that was introduced uh, starting in the Windows Server 2012 and the, the main difference is like previously we have in uh, unconstrained and constrained delegation, a computer or user object was told that which resources it can delegate to and whom it can impersonate. But in resource-based constrained delegations, what happens is the computers or the resources specify that who they will trust for delegation. So in this case, we have another property, which is a uh, computer objects have this property name MSDS allowed to act on behalf of other identity. What that means is uh, like in our scenario, we have a uh, like prod SVC, I, uh, I believe, or web SRV is the one again. So that has the uh, like on that, we have got a generic, right? Using that, what we can do is we can uh, change the MSDS allowed to act on behalf of other identity attribute. Or like you could have a, something like a generic right access, or you gain access to some user with privilege uh, of privilege groups who have generic right access over the computer accounts. Or the third thing could be uh, you could use MITM six with restaurant responder and NTLM DDX. So again, uh, what these things like the main goal is we either have gotten access to a uh, computer, or we will be creating a fake computer. Then we will be changing the original computer uh, account if we have got uh, somehow a way to change the MSDS allowed to act on behalf of other identity attribute. And if we are able to add uh, our fake computer into that group, then we can use the fake computer to impersonate any user on that machine or essentially gain local admin access on that machine just by exploiting this uh, like generic right or like just having a certain right privileges over a machine. So moving ahead with the next uh, part is you could use something like a uh, run bloodhound or query from that attacker Ubuntu machine. I have already uploaded the zip file for the bloodhound data on the GitHub. So you can check that out of importing the data to the bloodhound. Now the exploitation part, what we can do in this case is I'll be demonstrating that from the impacted module. So 
what we will see is uh, in the lab is you will see that there is a username rbcd and it has generic right over the web srv computer so we will use crack map execute first to check the machine account quota for this rbcd user in this case we don't need actually the windows machines now So now we are running this uh, crack map exec uh, module and it says that okay this uh, uh, RBCD user this has got a machine account quota of 10 or it can add up to 10 computers. Now using the add computer module of impacted I'll be adding in a new user account to that uh, domain. Sorry my bad again. And see, we have created a fake computer on the domain using just the domain admins, uh, like this RBCD user credentials. You could essentially use any user's credential to uh, add a computer to the domain, uh, provided it has the machine quota. Now, what we are doing is we are checking the MSDS allowed to delegate to on behalf of other identity attribute on the web SRV machine. So we see that currently this MSDS allowed to delegate to on behalf of other identity is empty. But uh, what we can do is since this uh, RBCD user, uh, this has the uh, like the generic right attribute or it can modify the user object. I could simply add in a computer like, uh, so I'm uh, changing that MSDS allowed to act on behalf of other identity and I'm adding the fake computers uh, set or injecting that set of that fake computer uh, using the RBCD user's credentials. Once uh, that is done, I can confirm that, yeah, I can basically read. So like accounts allowed to act on behalf of other identity, it is the fake zero one account. Now we have configured the RBCD. Even if we, right now we use the find delegation, we would find that uh, RBCD is configured. Like the scenario for RBCD is configured. So if I use the domain user credentials right now, you'll see that fake uh, computer has got a resource based constraint delegation rights to web SRV. And as a last resort, what we can do is dump the credentials since uh, uh, ex like exploiting this RBCD, we can uh, get a service ticket on that machine, like impersonating anyone on that machine. Like service ticket for this administrator user has been cached, we need to export it to KRB 5CC name so that we can use the in packet ka secret dumps module to dump the hashes. And once we run this last command, you'll see that we are able to dump basically all the local administrator hashes. Now, uh, you are uh, seeing that you get the DP API machine uh, key as well. You see the domain cache credentials for the domain uh, uh, user as well. If there was some domain administrator account, you could use that. Also one interesting scenario is sometimes the machines in a domain, they use the golden image. So maybe you could try to spray this uh, NTLM hash across the multiple accounts in the domain to see that if they are a golden image and if you compromise some other machines in the domain. So that's it. Uh, if you have got any questions,
as you mentioned, unconstrained delegation. Yeah. Uh, please continue, sir. Yeah. So, as you mentioned, unconstrained delegation is set on the. Uh, I guess I answered that. If a user has unconstrained delegation set and has access to a SPN, then he can have access to that SPN as well, right? Correct me if I am wrong, please. Okay, Diaz. So, uh, not unconstrained, but in case of constrained delegation, the user that you are impersonating, in this case, we were impersonating the administrator user. So, if an administrator has got the SIFs uh, or the uh, time or the LDAP, the common things, then you can impersonate uh, those. Now, you cannot impersonate anyone the under uh, like any service which is not running under that user. May you please tell the operating system version which you are using in the lab. Okay, so Ikam, uh, I am using the Windows Server 2019 machines in the lab. Uh, if you like head over to the, like uh, everything that you see in the lab is pretty much explainable from the GitHub repository itself. About the lab, whatever you are asking, all the code base, how to set up, everything is there on the GitHub. Oh, and uh, like, sorry. So if you check out the roles over here, I've created a role that uh, which AMI image I want to use. So Windows AMI is under the search. If you go to the main.yaml, you'll find that I'm using Windows Server 2019. I hope that answers your question. Can we set up? Yeah, uh, Hemant, uh, essentially I, I, I have sent up the, set up the lab on the AWS feed here only. Just you need to make sure about one thing that uh, since you are spinning up five lab, so it is going to consume up your, like the free tier quota really quick. And also like you have to monitor the like bandwidth because the like there is a limit of, I guess one GB or something about how much data you can transfer in a month. So you have to be cautious about that. But yeah, the lab, essentially, you can spin up for testing on for free on AWS. That is how I have hosted it. Since I am very new to this, I could only understand 20% of it. So my question is, what all are the prerequisites required to practice at all? Uh, Ashutosh, uh, what I would recommend is uh, the sessions recording will be available, the slides will be available, the labs will be available. Apart from that, if you have got other questions, uh, what you can do is you can uh, like search for the topics and read around the blog post on that topic. AD Security has got fantastic blog, blog posts on this topic. Uh, Anjoy has got a nice blog posts on this topic. Ultra Security has got nice blog posts on this topic. You could so you could read them. In most of the engagements, are you scan the environment by Nessus, then go for manual or else? Um, sort of, it uh, like it depends what kind of engagements are you talking about. If you are talking about Active Directory engagements, then you have got an assume based scenario. So generally, so you get a domain user credentials and then you use them to, or like uh, if there is a network then obviously you'll have to find a foothold somehow basically any compromise way and then uh, using that method you will be able to landing uh, land yourself into the inside the domain or gain a domain user credentials and then from there on you'll be able to move forward into the domain basically the goal of starting an active directory engagement is you need to have a domain user's credential Either you exploit or gain, gain it some way, but if you want to compromise the active directory, you need to have a domain user credentials, be it for enumeration or anything. You can run a bunch of LDAP queries. You can check for open services uh, if that allows some enumeration anonymously. So that's it. Are there any more uh, questions? Uh, we still have two minutes uh, left of the Q&A session. Yeah, one more thing I'll like quickly demonstrate is how you destroy the lab. That is one thing I was about to de demonstrate then. 
So in order to destroy the lab, you will have to go to the document root or root of the delegation lab folder. And you will again run the sim similar command, Ansible playbook, but this time destroy.yml. And make sure the profile that you're using because uh, the profile with which you created with the same profile you'll have to destroy. So you just run this. Mm, easy to instance. It should be easy to just. Just a minute, something is broken. Okay, I'll be pushing a commit to that. It was easy to instance only. Okay, I'm doing it from inside of the Ubuntu machine where I should be doing it from the yeah. So this will terminate all the resources. So there were no resources and it could not uh, locate essentially all the files uh, where they were. So it wasn't able to resolve it. But yeah, uh, while you're destroying the resources, make sure that you know which region and where you have spun up the land because you don't want to like essentially destroy resources uh, anonymously on any uh, domain or anywhere randomly. So that is it, Aparna. Like... All right. Um, thank you guys for being such amazing participants and thank you, Sayed, for delivering such an amazing uh, uh, session. Thanks, so, for me. yeah. Thank you, guys. Uh, there is one question from Ashwini. Uh, if you are completely new to AD, like uh, what you can do is you can host, uh, like I would recommend is try to spin up your own labs try to replicate the vulnerabilities and uh, try to like replicate the common things like understand the authentication mechanisms like Kerber roasting, AS rep roasting, how NTLM authentication is working. Triacme has got nice labs on it. Altered Security has got fantastic posts on it. And there are a bunch of labs that are already available on the GitHub that you can spin up uh, on your own. I won't be recommending uh, like going for something as big as game of active directory towards the start because that is going to demotivate. Okay, guys, any more questions? I guess there are no more questions. Um, I'll be stopping the screen share. Okay. So thank you guys. Uh, the recording of this particular webinar will be released uh, soon on our digital channels. To get access and updates on our uh, content, uh, please uh, subscribe and follow our uh, channels. All right. Uh, thank you, guys. Thank you, Sayed. Uh, thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.